right, kiddos, we are back. Today we're going to talk about melting and boiling point, and we'll even have a demonstration partway through today's video. So let's discuss melting point very quickly. Um, if we have a solid and it reaches a temperature where the forces holding its crystal lattice together are broken, it then becomes a liquid that's called melting. So the amount of energy required to melt one mole of a solid depends upon the strength of the forces keeping the particles together in the solid. So those could be LDFs, those could be dipole to dipole, they could be ionic bonds, or they could be hydrogen bonds. So if we consider water, the hydrogen bonds between water molecules are strong. So a relatively large amount of energy is required to melt water because hydrogen bonds between water molecules, not within, but between the water molecules are relatively strong. However, the energy required to melt ice is much less than the energy required to melt table salt. So what does that tell you about the bonds that hold the ions, sodium and chloride, together within the crystalline lattice of table salt? Yeah, that must be a very, very strong force, even stronger than hydrogen bonding. So ionic bonds in sodium chloride are much, much stronger than the hydrogen bonding between water molecules in ice. All right, let's talk about boiling point, because boiling point is also determined by the strength of intermolecular forces of attraction. So the technical definition for boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure, remember vapor pressure at the beginning of this unit, of a liquid equals the external or atmospheric pressure. And that's called boiling point. So let me try to describe this to you. Um, within a liquid, um, the liquid particle needs to turn to gaseous particles. They need to separate from each other by huge distances. Now let's just imagine a beaker of water or a flask of water. How can we get those water molecules to separate from each other? Well, we could heat them up, couldn't we, and increase their energy, and so they can get farther and farther away from each other. As they get far enough away from each other, they can go from the liquid phase to the gaseous phase and form a bubble. However, if the external pressure on the liquid increases, it's harder for that bubble within the liquid to form. And so the boiling point increases as the external pressure increases. <laughs> so if it's possible for water to boil at temperatures higher than 100, degrees Celsius by increasing the pressure, it is also possible for water to boil at temperatures less than 100 degrees Celsius. So of course, instead of increasing the pressure above the liquid, we would have to decrease it. So if I were to measure the atmospheric pressure on a typical day here in Salt Lake City, it would be about 645 millimeters of mercury. And water will boil at about 98 degrees Celsius. Now at sea level, where water is, or excuse me, where atmospheric pressure is generally about 760 millimeters of mercury, which by the way we call one atmosphere of pressure, the boiling point of water equals 100 degrees Celsius. So you can see as the atmospheric pressure increases above the surface of the liquid, it's harder for those bubbles to form, and therefore the boiling point of that liquid will increase. So if we take a look at this graph here, we can see the boiling point of water at various temperatures. Now water is this blue line here, of course, labeled water, and we can see that at 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 760 millimeters of mercury. So when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the atmospheric pressure, then the liquid will begin to boil. Now, if I lower the pressure to, let's say, 650 millimeters of mercury, let's see, we can get water to boil at a lower temperature. Is it possible to get water to boil at about room temperature, which is right around 20 degrees Celsius? Yeah, but we have to drop the pressure to a very, very small amount. So the vapor pressure of water at about 20 degrees Celsius 
is somewhere around 20 millimeters of mercury. So if we can get the external pressure to go that low, we can get water to boil at room temperature. And that's where I want to pause right now and show you a demonstration where I have a flask of water on my desktop and I've removed the air from it. I've reduced the pressure inside the flask to much, much lower than room pressure. In fact, it's about 20 millimeters of mercury. And you can see as that pressure lowers, bubbles begin to form and I'm able to boil water at room temperature. So let's take a look at that um, demonstration now. All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, notice that ethanol, ethanol must have weaker intermolecular forces than water because ethanol um, reaches a vapor pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury when it's about 75 degrees Celsius. So it's easier to separate those ethanol molecules from each other than it is water molecules from each other because you can see that they have a, um, they, they achieve uh, a vapor pressure of 760 at a much, much lower temperature. All right, so define normal boiling point. So let's define what normal is. So up here, we define boiling point where um, it was the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid equals the external or atmospheric pressure. Well, normal boiling point is going to be very similar to that. Normal boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid equals 760 millimeters of mercury or what we like to call one atmosphere. Okay, so that would be normal. On a typical day at sea level, the vapor pressure of water reaches 760 millimeters of mercury at 100 degrees Celsius. For ethanol, on a typical day at sea level, it looks like it's somewhere around 75. Now, of course, it's possible for water to boil at temperatures higher than 100 degrees Celsius. That's if the, uh, the pressure above the water is in excess of 760 millimeters of mercury. If that's the case, a greater amount of energy is required for the molecules to push each other apart. So let me take a look at this, these pictures with you. At sea level, water boils at about 100 degrees Celsius. On the type of top of Pikes Peak in Colorado, where the elevation is much higher than, of course, sea level, 4,400 meters, water boils only at 85 degrees Celsius. And then on top of Mount Everest, if you're able to get to the peak of Mount Everest and boil some water, you will find that the bubbles start to form at 71 degrees Celsius, almost 30 degrees Celsius lower than at sea level. So as elevation increases, of course, atmospheric pressure decreases, so it's easier for those bubbles to form. It requires less energy. It's also important to note that different liquids have different boiling points. Liquids with low boiling points have particles with low intermolecular attractions. Um, for each other. These substances evaporate more rapidly and are said to be volatile. Imagine if you spill toenail polish remover on your foot. Um, that toenail polish remover evaporates very, very quickly. So it feels cold, doesn't it? Yeah, the intermolecular forces of attraction in the acetone molecules or between acetone molecules in toenail polish remover are, are lower than they would be in water, so they evaporate more quickly. Remember, evaporation is a cooling process, and so it would make your foot feel cold if you spilled that toenail polish remover on your toes or your foot. Liquids that boil at high temperatures have high intermolecular attraction and are considered to be non-volatile. So consider something like, I don't know, maybe, maybe motor oil. If you um, 
spilled some motor oil on your driveway. It would take a very, very long time for that motor oil to evaporate because the intermolecular forces of attraction between the motor oil molecules are strong. And so it evaporates very, very slowly. And so we call that non-volatile. They'd also have much higher boiling and melting points um, than with something that was non-volatile or had weak intermolecular forces of attraction. All right. Let's go a little bit further. We'll define sublimation and we'll wrap up this video before we get into something called liquefaction. So sublimation <coughs> is a change directly from the solid phase to the gas phase. So from a solid directly to a gas. So if I were to write that in a type of equation, I'd have this substance X in its solid phase turning into, of course, substance X still, but it would be in the gaseous phase. It would skip the liquid phase. It would go directly from a solid to a gas. And when that happens, that's called sublimation. Now, there are a few substances that you might be familiar with that, that, that do this. The most common is dry ice. Dry ice is carbon solid, uh, excuse me, solid carbon dioxide. And I can take a chunk of dry ice and sit it on my desktop, and you won't see a puddle of carbon dioxide on my desktop. You will see the dry ice slowly sublime. It will go from the solid phase directly to the gaseous phase. Now, I expect you to be able to look up a couple of other things that sublime. I think you can do this, and I want you to do that on your own. So I'll give you one, dry ice. The others you need to do on your own. Now, one more thing I want to mention to you before we quit for the day is when I take substance X in its solid phase and I uh, sublime it, so it goes into its gaseous phase, that requires energy. It's endothermic. So I'm going to put delta H on the left-hand side here. This amount of energy would be equal to the amount of energy if I took substance X in its solid phase and turned it into substance X in its liquid phase, and then took the liquid phase and turned that into the gaseous phase. So these two steps together, the delta H for those two steps, would be equal to the delta H of sublimation. So if you remember, we call um, the heat required uh, to melt something at its melting point is called the delta H of fusion. And the heat to vaporize something at its boiling point is called the delta H of vaporization. So we could write that as an equation. We could say the heat of fusion plus the heat of vaporization equals the heat of sublimation. Okay? Wanted to wrap up there for the day. All right, see you soon. We'll talk about liquefaction and phase diagrams next. Bye-bye.